It's obviously a bake-off this morning. A number of you have brought things, so thank you very much. We're going to enjoy that in a little bit. I promise I will not eat any before it starts, as we put them out. Um, there's no voting this year. I, I decided to chop that off a long time ago. I just didn't tell anyone about that part. It's just a lot easier. There's maybe less anxiety for you now to not worry about what people think of your food. Yes even though it's not this. So anyways, just enjoy food when you go back this morning. Enjoy everyone's treats and things like that. There's labels on everything. Uh, in the bulletin, there's a thing called West Elementary Treats. And what that is, is just uh, the idea of joining justice team and caring for some neighborhood schools that we have nearby. So on the 16th, uh, the request is that if you would like to participate, bring in a baked treat, kind of like this morning almost, Bring it in with you, uh, bring it in the kitchen probably, and then on Monday morning we'll be delivering those to the staff over at West Elementary, right down the road, and they can enjoy those uh, for that day, and probably maybe for a couple days, unless they eat them all quick. So, just something to love, uh, some teachers that are living our, or work in our neighborhood. Uh, Christmas cards for the homebound, you have a, in your box, if you have a mailbox there, there might be one at the information desk in the back, there's a, a sheet, about filling out a Christmas card, and that is uh, some directions on there about bringing it. Next week, there's going to be some bags you can drop those in, so read that uh, note just to help fill out a, a note of encouragement, a Christmas card uh, for a number of people who can't really come here during the, during the mornings. Uh, I did want to mention Fran Potter. So you remember Fran Potter? Some of you don't remember her. She passed away in the spring, I believe it was. Uh, this past year, and she, her family wanted to honor her with a gift uh, to Calvary for to buy furniture because of her love for hospitality. So the furniture that you see in the Welcome Center that's new uh, this morning, uh, and that is from Fran Potter. So when you sit there and enjoy it, Fran Potter uh, is remembered by those new pieces of furniture. Um, another thing we we'll go through here today, Junior High Brunch, this is also in the bulletin. Um, junior High on the 16th, after the Christmas program that's going to happen, uh, Junior High is going to be running a brunch to support their winter retreat that's coming up. So right after that event will happen, you can go down to the gym, there'll be a brunch, a little fundraiser for Junior High. So read about that, that's in the bulletin, and then you'll see more about that in a little bit too. So I think that's all I want to say. Um, other things are in the bulletin, read it, there's a lot going on uh, right now this year anyway, so that's all I have to say. So we gather this morning on this uh, first Sunday of December. Um, does anybody know why we have candles here? What's this season? Yes. All right. Yeah, that's right, you know. <laughs> so this season of Advent is a season of waiting. Um, probably for kids, and maybe some of us adult kids, uh, <laughs> we're waiting for gifts <laughs> that we're going to receive on, on Christmas Day. But really it's a, a, a season that the churches around the world uh, mark to wait, uh, not just to wait for Christmas and to celebrate the Christmas of Jesus' first coming, but really the second coming of Jesus Christ. Right? So Jesus came. And now we're living in between the time of when Jesus first came, and He will come again. So I'm going to read a couple uh, passages uh, from the Bible that uh, really talks about as we as we wait. Um, that really the season uh, and the Jesus second coming is the time when we really remember all the promises of God, uh, all the ultimate. Uh, fulfillment of all the promises in the Old Testament is uh, will will come true uh, when Jesus comes back again, and uh, that's the day when uh, when just like the scripture says, the wolf will lie with lamb, the death will be swallowed up, and every tear will be wiped away, and uh, it is it is the that's the hope. Uh, we, we wait for Jesus' coming because then, uh, then Jesus will uh, wipe every tear away and uh, our sins will be uh, no more. And the first song we're going to sing in this uh, Advent Sunday is the Come Thou Expected 
Jesus in the, this, the, this hymn has this verse, From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in Thee. And I really hope that as we spend this season of Advent that we will truly experience God coming to us and comfort, comforting us uh, of God's, um, God's power. So here's Titus chapter 2. It says this, uh, We wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And in Isaiah 40, it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Because in verse 5 it says, The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So let us pray and then uh, after we pray, uh, the children here and, and Phoebe with children, our youth will uh, light the candle and uh, lead us into a uh, time of worship and then we'll sing. Right, let's pray. God, we come together on this Sunday, uh, first Sunday of Advent, uh, to be reminded, Lord, for your first coming uh, as a babe, uh, one who was so vulnerable uh, as a little baby come to this world to show us what true love is and true hope is in this life. And we pray, God, that as we uh, spend this uh, month of December, the season of Advent, that we would, uh, that you would increase that longing for your coming. Your coming, not only in the, the second coming when you will come and you will uh, bring uh, the shalom, the peace on earth uh, for good, but every day this month, Lord, that we would see your coming by the power of your Spirit, and by your Word, and by your community of faith in this world, Lord, that we would receive you with openness, and with willing heart, and with humble heart. So, Lord, receive our worship this morning, and may you, Lord Jesus Messiah, your name be lifted high, because you are beautiful, and powerful, and wonderful in all your ways. So, Lord, we come here to worship you, so receive our worship, and may you bless your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On this first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. Hope is our assurance that God will finish all he has started. Hope is our confidence that he will do all he has promised. All the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our hope, today and forever. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God, God for an indescribable gift. gift.
on this day and in this life. So Lord, as we continue to worship you, we pray that your, your presence of peace and love and grace and mercy will reign in our hearts this morning, that we may be renewed, we may know how loving you are. So we worship you, God, we adore you, we bless your name, Lord Jesus. Have your place in this place. We thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And God is God of peace, and God brings peace to all of us, and we are to share that peace with one another. So let's turn to our neighbors around us and say, Peace of the Lord be with you, or give them a big hug and say hello to one another. Who 
are grieving that things are not the way they're supposed to be. We think of John Webster and we think of Dave and Sarah and this is so, they're so hard and insurance snags and, and John's still not able to come home. Lord, would you work in a mighty way in their lives? Lord, we lift up to you the people who we love, who need you, people who are grieving, people who are struggling, uh, fighting cancer, people who are just sad because they're not in good relationship with their family, people who don't have enough in this time of Advent, people who need practical resources just to get through the day. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your comfort on your people here in this sanctuary and here in the city of Wyoming. That you would pour out your hope, that you would be the lifter of our heads and that you would turn our eyes to Jesus in profound ways this season. That we can see your truth and your love and how indeed you are Emmanuel with us, God with us. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. And Lord, we ask that you would increase our faith that we may be faithful to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fifteen years. That is a long time. Praise be to God. I think I'm uh, 20 right now. Uh, that is a gift. So thanks for your faithfulness. Um, the offer this morning is for Calvary Ministries, which is uh, about 45 things that happen here on Sunday during the week and wherever you are. Um, so we're testing out the open mic. It still doesn't work, so I'll get rid of it in a moment here. <laughs> but the offering is for Calvary Ministries. And the special offering this month is for Evergreen, which is going to be shared about more next week. Um, you can read what it's about in the bullet here. Wanda Kuzi knows about it. She's going to share about it next week. And um, so during Advent, we go to a closet that is an undisclosed location back in the hallway there, and we pull out our handbells. And so I just want to say thanks to the ringers, I think is what you're officially called, for uh, playing handbells this morning as we give our offerings to God. And get rid of this mic. <laughs>
to hear the premier handbell choir in the area this week. And honestly, I don't think they were that much better than you guys were this morning, so. <laughs> I did have a lot more bells, but um, I might add that I'm not musically trained, so my judgment not, might be 100% accurate. But that was really a uh, blessing, so thank you for doing that. It's already started, I noticed. Advent has already started. And we've not only started reflecting on who Jesus is, we started the craziness of the holiday seasons, right? And whether it's standing on your roof on Thanksgiving Day when there's snow and ice and trying to get the lights just right, or gathering all the food and everything else, or even gathering stuff for worship service together on Sunday morning here, things get a little crazy in December. And that's why in the Advent season we spend a particular amount of time talking about the real reason for Christmas, which is Jesus. And this morning we're going to talk particularly about why Jesus has come and what he said he was uh, going to do and what he did. Because of this, we're stepping away from the story for a few uh, weeks. Um, you might know if you've been here. You do know if you've been here, but you might know if you haven't been here too that we've been going through this story uh, Bible, which is excerpts from Scripture. We're going to step away from that here in Advent um, to focus on Advent. Interestingly for Lent, which is before Easter, it actually the readings match up perfectly, so we won't do that then. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a small sermon series called From Malachi to Matthew. And of course, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. We're going to talk about prophecy toward Jesus and then how that was fulfilled in Jesus. And so to do that, this morning we're going to go to Malachi chapter 3. I referred to Malachi last week um, in chapter 2, but we're going to go to Malachi chapter 3, uh, chapter 2, 17 actually. And uh, we're going to read through verse 5. And I don't have a good spot to hand these out, so I'm going to ask a couple people to... Can you guys do this? That might be feels hard. All right, so... Uh, We'll probably can find a better way to do this, but if you need a sheet with a scripture on it and to write on it, often people just take one bullet in a family, so we want this in your hands so you can scribble and write. Just take the side and hand out to whoever wants them or doesn't want them, as the case may be. And uh, as they're doing that, you can either read it off that sheet or you can open your Bible to page 1001. And I'll read the scripture to you. In just a moment. And also, as you can tell, this will lead right into communion today. All right, so let's read the Bible passage this morning. Before we do that, I'm just going to do all the awkward things at once and go and get one of these myself because I gave them all the way. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. All right, so Malachi chapter 2, 17 through 3, 5 says this. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have you wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in the days gone by, as in former years. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, who, and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, so every once in a while I come up here and I tell you pretty forthrightly that I have an inclination to disregard some rules in society as set for us. 
Um, most of us have this one way or another. I have it in many ways. So most of the rules I've learned, like traffic rules, uh, other rules, I've had to consciously realize that everyone must submit themselves to the governing authorities even if they don't like it, right? And uh, yeah, it's okay to not obey a rule if it says don't worship God, but honestly, most of the rules that I want to disobey aren't anything to do with that. And it's been a process of learning uh, to obey different rules, and most of us have this. Uh, this week, I realized there's a rule that's not really a moral rule or a legal rule, but sort of a guideline that's been set up that I figured out how to defeat, and I actually had some enjoyment with this. So, when I grew up, I had a Monte Carlo, I got it when I was 15 years old, and discovered pretty quickly how to spin that thing around and hit the brakes real hard or spin it around. Of course, all the power was on the back end, so you could spin it this way, you could stop, you could skid. And it was a lot of fun. Plus, I grew up in Iowa, there was gravel roads everywhere, so I got pretty good at sliding this thing around. And uh, by the grace of God, I never got hurt, although I did terrify myself a few times. Um, but as cars have gotten newer and newer, they have a few things on them that sort of is designed to prevent this stuff, right? They have ABS, which stands for Automatic Braking System, which means that if you hit the brakes and it's slippery, it goes right? And it theoretically makes you stop sooner because it applies the brakes again and again. Um, that's okay. And now they have something where you hit the gas and it's slippery, it prevents the wheels from spinning right, so it goes instead of like the old cars, it goes and it would kind of be fun, right? And beyond that, they have something called stabilization control now, which adjusts the power to all four wheels and makes it pretty impossible to actually do anything fun with your car at all, right? So we got a, a new van. Uh, the other one finally died. The training engine were going out of it. I couldn't fix it anymore. So we got a new van. And this van was literally designed by committee, and it was a series of concessions um, because it was the end of the line for this particular model. So that said, it's a good vehicle, but the ABS and the stabilization control isn't exactly very finely tuned, so it comes on too often, and it makes the car no fun at all. But I figured out how to defeat it this, this uh, week. If you just go on some ice and hit that e-brake a couple times, it messes up the whole system and shuts it off. <laughs> which is a lot more fun, because you can actually spin forward, you can slide and do a number of things, and it's just a lot more fun. And now I'm not recommending that, because actually all those things are put into place to protect me and my family. Um, notice that Marsha never does this, ever. But it's put in place to protect me and my family, um, but still I have some kind of uh, fun uh, breaking through these, especially when Marsha's not in the car. And she's a nursery this morning, so I can tell you all these things. <laughs> the kids find it rather amusing, but not all right, for good reason. So in our lives, we have this all the time, where there's rules that are given to us, we know that the right thing for us to do, we know that they are there to protect us and help us, not only us, but the people around us. But sometimes when you break those rules, it does something for us. Maybe it, it kind of helps our pain a little bit. Maybe it just gives us some sensory input. Or maybe it's just kind of fun to do, even though the consequences aren't that great. And we, uh, we constantly, no matter who we are, have a tendency in one area or another to rules that have been set up for us by society, by God, or by this simply the way the world is created um, to not hurt each other. Now, in our passage this morning, uh, there's a whole nation that's disobeying God. And we referred to this last week, and if you know the book of Malachi, you know a little bit about what it's about. But it outlines the various ways that the nation of Israel was sinning. And uh, some of them are just in the passage here, the oppressed people who are powerless. Others, like last week, are adultery and divorce. Um, there's also this whole thing where they're bringing offerings to God, like they're taking the worst animals in their flock, the ones that are going to die anyway, the ones that are lame, the ones that are sick, and they're bringing them to the temple and say, here my awesome sacrifices, and the Levites are accepting these sacrifices, and they're not saying, like, get that animal out of here, they're saying, hey, that's all good, let's all do this sacrifice thing with your lousy animal. So there's a lot of collusion here between the Levites and the people, and plus the Levites who are supposed to be judging accurately, aren't judging accurately at all, and they're showing favoritism, so again, more people get oppressed. And then we have the end of Malachi, which is kind of a well-known passage, it says, you don't bring offerings to me anymore, and you're wondering why you're not blessed in your life. So there's a whole list of things that they're doing that are pretty messed up, and are not appropriate in your relationship with God. They're sort of breaking all the rules, not only as individuals, but as a culture. So a while back, I came into some sunglasses. What do you think? 
I kind of like him, but I don't quite have the courage to pull it off and wear him on a regular basis. Some days, when I'm driving the camper and I'm feeling particularly confident, I put them on, but like, <laughs> You gotta do something when you get older and you know you're basically not cool, all right? <laughs> I'll compensate that for that somehow. Um, but I have him on this morning because, just to illustrate the fact that if we grew up in a family or a culture, it doesn't matter what culture it is, there's some things that we know, and there's some things that we don't know. And our culture, our experience, our faith experience, the way we understand God, uh, puts a lens on our face, and we look at the world through that lens. So right now, you all look kind of purple and kind of fuzzy because I didn't clean these at all. So uh, when we look through our cultural faith lens, sometimes, not sometimes, always, the world looks a little different than it actually is. If you look at worldview studies, what they teach pretty clearly and what makes sense too is that there is a reality we know, that's a certain slice of reality, and there's a broader reality that other people know, and of course there's gradations in that, our culture, broader culture, there's more and more reality that most people know. And then there's a reality that exists, and it's even like further out, and of course we can never take our glasses off our head because someone surreptitiously has put duct tape on them and they're just stuck there. It takes a lot of work to get our cultural faith glasses off our head. Now, if you take this about faith, this extends pretty directly. It's a pretty good parallel. So there's things about our faith and our obedience and our morality that we know. There's things about our faith and obedience and reality that other people know that we don't know. It's broader than us. Obviously, other people's faithfulness and knowledge is more than our own. And then there's everything about faith and reality and knowledge that exists. That exists. It's much broader. And here in this passage, God is coming through an oracle to the prophet Malachi, and he's telling these people, there's something that you're not seeing, and what I want to do is I want to shatter your glasses and help you understand that there is a greater faithfulness that you are called to. And that's the context of the book of Malachi. Now, in the passage that we're dealing with this morning, it's directly about the messenger that God is going to send, which makes sense to focus on this passage during Advent in particular. So let's get into this um, text here a minute. This kind of is coming off uh, the previous admonitions and statements of unfruitfulness. Fruitfulness, And it says pretty clearly, you have wearied the Lord with your words. And then they ask, how have you wearied him? How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or, where is the God of justice? Now, I thought about talking this at length, but I simply want to point out one thing about these two sentences, and that both of these are sort of fronts or perspectives or beliefs that will keep people from a relationship with God. If you believe that God is happy with evil people, you're not going to be in a relationship with God either because you're not happy about that and you won't pursue God, or you'll be so caught up with evil that God isn't going to have a relationship with you. And the where is the God of justice phrase could be a devout lament prayer, but if you simply don't believe that God is a God of justice, and you don't, like he's just, this is just something you believe, it's also going to keep you out of relationship with God because like I've said in previous weeks, previous, uh, really last half year, our beliefs about God either facilitate a relationship with God or keep us away from a relationship with God. So often um, people say to me, I don't believe in God, and I ask about the God they don't believe in, and I'm like, I don't believe in that God either. It's helpful to understand who God actually is so we can worship the God that exists and not the one that we sort of have believed in in our mind. These two things are keeping people away from God. I also find it interesting that if I think about wearying God with my words, I would normally think of words I'm speaking to God. And notice these words aren't to God at all, they're about God. They're to each other about God. And I think it's uh, interesting that God says, you're wearying me with your words, you're not even talking to me, but you're talking about me, and I'm just so tired of it, he says. And in the next passage, there's a direct uh, kind of speaking against it. So the people are talking, they're wearying God with their words, and then God says, you know what, I'm going to send you some words of my own. I'm going to send you a messenger, and that messenger is going to tell you things, and in particular, the messenger of the covenant is going to tell you things about the covenant. So you've been talking, you don't know much about God, you got it all wrong, and you're doing things that are wrong, but here's the deal, I'm going to send you a messenger that's going to talk to you about the real things of the covenant. It's a little bit like getting a phone call and to a church and you're not really paying attention, like, snap to it, all right? I got something to tell you. All right, so that's kind of what's going on. But they didn't have to tell back then. Everybody's thinking about it, so I may as well talk about it, right? All right. 
Uh, the messenger here, this is fascinating. I will send my messenger. Anybody know what the Hebrew word for messenger is? Malachi. Malachi, yeah, thank you. I knew someone would. Uh, Malachi. So the book of Malachi is really, it could be translated a couple of different ways. It could have translated an angel, but the word here, I will send my messenger, is the Old Testament word for angel. Normally it's translated angel, but because of the book of Malachi, it's translated messenger. So I was going to send his angel, his messenger, his Malachi, which I think is fascinating here, because when we look at this passage, you normally think, I will send my messenger, who's going to prepare the way, who will prepare the way before me? All right, so who do you think normally prepares the way for Jesus in the New Testament? John the Baptist, right? And that is accurate. This is pointing toward John the Baptist. But if you look at the beginning of the book of Malachi, it says something like, this is an oracle given to the people of Israel from the Lord by his Malachi, by his messenger, by his angel. And after the book of Malachi was uh, given orally and then written down eventually, there was 400 years of silence leading up to the time of Jesus. So in a very real sense, this book by an individual named Malachi, or who knows, in fact, was the very thing that helped prepare the way for Jesus 400 years later. If you look at the context of Jesus, the Pharisees are often pictured as the people who are bad because they didn't respond to Jesus, but they had got something right. The religious leadership of the time of Jesus had looked at this book and taken it really, really, really seriously. And they had taken the admonitions in this book very much to heart. And they had understood that legalistic righteousness does have virtue because at least it helps you from not breaking the clear moral guidelines that God has given. Throughout this book of the Bible, Malachi, there's some very clear, very direct, very explicit instructions about how we're supposed to live in a relationship with God, and it's laid out incredibly clearly. And over the next 400 years, the people took it to heart. And this is not bad um, advice for us as we think about our own lives. If God stops talking to you for a while, hopefully not 400 years, right? But four days, four weeks, four months, for years perhaps. A very good bit of advice is what do you do if God stops talking to you? Well, you listen to his last known instructions to you. And here, this is exactly what Israel did. They listened and they took these things to heart. Now, they might have gone too far with legalistic righteousness and left the relationship, the covenant relationship aside, but they did listen. And they did follow. And also at the time of Jesus, this messianic expectation, this expectation of a Messiah, someone who would save them from their sins and their enemies, was at an all-time high. And so this book here in Malachi is actually does prepare the way before Jesus came, 400 years later. And then it says, And then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant who you desire will come. And of course, that is eventually referring to to Jesus suddenly coming to the temple. And as you think about Jesus suddenly coming to the temple, I kind of uh, I like how this gets played out, because suddenly when Jesus is 12, he stays in the temple asking the elders their really insightful questions, which is the rabbinical way of teaching. He's young, but he's asking the insightful questions. And he comes to the temple suddenly a few other times, too. Remember at the feast day, at the last and greatest day of the feast, he also stands up and says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and thirsty, and I will give you life, and streams of living water will flow from without you, within you. And then another time he comes to the temple, and very suddenly drives out the merchants and the money exchangers, and that was more than a little sudden. And he came to the temple suddenly in some other ways too. He just came there. Suddenly there he was after so many years of expectation. He's a messenger of the covenant, an agreement between God and man whom they desire. And then it gets to, I think, a challenging message for Christmas. It says this, Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? Christmas is billed as the most wonderful time of the year because it's a time for reflection, it's a time for celebration, it's a time for bringing out recipes like desserts that we're going to have after church, uh, candies, and all sorts of weird things that we only do once a year. And it's the most wonderful, amazing time of the year. But we often think about it, like really it's just all about the wonderful things that happen. It's baby Jesus, and he saved us from our sins. We don't think about much of the applications about what the Bible actually said Jesus came for it. Here, here it says that 
Who can endure the day of Jesus' coming? This doesn't sound like the most wonderful time of the year. This sounds like it might be something uh, kind of serious, and it goes on. He will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. So we sing these songs, right? We sing the song, Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire, I long to be holy. Uh, silver melts at about 1,750 degrees. Gold melts a little over 1,900 degrees. How many of y'all like to be burnt? <laughs> this is not a comfortable thing. I was selling Christmas trees one year, a uh, long time ago. I don't even know what it was for. We didn't sell any Christmas trees because it was cold. And, but there was this lot set up, and we had a deer, and me and my friend. And they had this like, mobile trailer that had a furnace in it, but the furnace wasn't on. So I guess even when I was a young person, I liked to mess with uh, mechanical things. So I opened the furnace door and opened the little round hash thing with a thumb tap on it, lit the thing, and got it started. It was pretty hot, and I went back, and I thought I'd better shut the little uh, thing there. So I turned the little round metal thing with that thumb tap over and pushed it over nicely, and I smelled my thumb before I felt it. That's not fun. It hurt. I was like, oh, that hurt. And it was dark in there, but man, I just burned. That, you know, pain is not a fun thing, but it says Jesus is going to come, and he's going to be like a refiner's fire to purify from us from all unrighteousness. And none of us like to go through difficult things, but the prayer and the psalm are appropriate, that we pray to God, Lord, please purify me from all unrighteousness. Help me be clean. Help me be new. I want to be someone different than I currently am. Over the last couple of Sundays, uh, actually last week Sunday and then Thanksgiving, they talked about Saul and talked about David. And of course, they kind of did the same type of sin. They wanted to kill somebody who wasn't a threat to their throne, but they thought they were. Um, that person, in both cases, actually was someone that really respected them and God and the throne and the nation, but they both wanted to do it. Saul didn't do it because he couldn't, and then David did do it when he killed Uriah. When you think about that, how is David a man after God's own heart? How is he a man after God's own heart when he did these horrible things? The difference between Saul and David is that David owned up to his own sin, went back again and again and again, and asked for forgiveness, owned his sins, said clearly it was wrong, I want to be made pure, and then God in his mercy, in his coming, as the messenger of the covenant comes into our lives and allows things to happen and sometimes does them proactively to allow us to be better versions of ourselves. And in many ways, that's what Christmas is about. Now, some of you are looking at this and going, laundry or so, really tight, flat. What are some other brands nowadays? Who knows? We, can use, we still use these soap nuts, so... We don't use soap anymore, but there's all sorts of brands you can get, and you think it's not that dangerous, but back in the day, they used a lot more caustic substances. I, don't, I think they were basic substances, like, is why a basic thing? Yeah, it is, right? Um, Ruth and Roger Cole are both like lifetime chemists, they know more about chemistry than any of us here. Um, so it's a basic thing, and it's really dangerous, actually. You get this stuff on you. That's a dangerous thing, and no one really wants a launderer soap on them, and that's what, that's what Jesus is coming to do. Now, he's coming to do two things, all right? He's coming to do two things, and the next two paragraphs here um, are really clear about this. Here we go. He's going to do two things. Uh, one category of people, he's going to put them on trial. Nope, I'm going to back up. One category of people, he's going to refine. And another category of people, he's going to put them on trial. The Levites, he's going to refine. He's going to make new, he's going to teach how to teach other people. He's going to make them the true worshipers. He's going to allow them to be uh, followers of God again. But there's another category of people that he's going to put them on trial. See the difference? Uh, some of us he refines, some of us he puts on trial and testifies against us. And what are the difference? What's the difference? And this is important because so many of us look at the Old Testament, see all this condemnation and judgment. Most, not all, but most of the condemnation and judgment and the death and destruction in the Old Testament are against people who aren't just disobeying the law of God, but are also oppressing and ruining the lives of a lot of other people around them. And that is, in fact, the case in this passage. He says, I'm going to put you on trial, I'm going to be quick to testify against sorcerers, 
And sorcerers are people that are using demonic power, and if you look at how the sexual works in the world, they're incredibly uh, just satanic people that oppress a lot of other people and destroy a lot of people's lives. And God says, I am not for that. I'm going to put them on trial. Adulterers, again, use other people for their own purposes, break covenant with their wives and the youth, as we talked about last week. Uh, perjurers, what's a perjurer? I'd look this up a little bit. Um, a perjurer is someone who lies in court mostly to take advantage of other people or to get out of being convicted themselves, right? So a perjurer is someone who, again, in court takes advantage of other people. Uh, this might be happening still in America. Um, people who defraud laborers of their wages. Wage theft is a huge thing, especially for uh, immigrants who don't have legal status. Uh, it's a massive thing that's happening here, even in West Michigan again. Uh, deprive people of their wages, oppress the widows and fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice, but do not fear me. In the Old Testament, there's three main categories of people that God is really for, and he's really against people who are against these people. And of course, it's a widow and orphan, which is why we have an offering for that ministry that's in the bulletin about orphans. Widow. And a little bit more of a politically charged topic, uh, people who don't have legal status in the country they're in. And God says, anybody who deprives those foreigners among you, I'm against. I'm going to testify against. I'm going to put them on trial. And the implication is there's going to be, there's going to be judgment. There's going to be judgment. I'm going to be against those people. So I referred to uh, David and Saul earlier. And the question is, how do we get to a relationship with Jesus Christ, even though we ourselves continually have an inclination to break the law and to do what we're not called to do? As David says to Saul at one point, from evildoers come evil deeds, and even if 60 or 80 or 95% of our life is straight, we know often that there's some areas of our life that just ain't right. How do we get to a right relationship with Jesus Christ? And to get to the answer to that, I want to do something we've been doing the last uh, couple services and read scripture and allow God to speak to you directly to it. And that's where this comes into play right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read Matthew 3, 1 through 11. I typed it wrong there. Uh, 1 through 11. I want to invite you to let God speak to you about whatever he may have on his heart for you. And I suspect a phrase will jump out. I think I never saw it that way before. I never understood it that way before. But also as you go through this, ask yourself the question, how do you get through a right relationship with God if things aren't right? in your life, and allow God to speak to you. So I'm going to read them. That's why I have this in front of you. I encourage you to scribble on this, make notes, circle, underline, um, do whatever you feel led to do. But give yourself freedom to do what you feel led to do. Matthew 3, starting at verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey, and people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, and the whole region of, region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him, in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What phrases jump out of you? Yeah, you'll baptize. 
receive the Holy Spirit. What jumped out at me is the fire. Anything else? Refiner's fire. Yeah, not just fire, not just burning up. It's a direct, I mean, that's why I read it, right? It's like, it's a fulfillment. Yeah. Ethan. He was spoken of. Yeah, he was spoken of. Yeah. God spoke and now he did it. Yeah. Produce fruit. Produce fruit, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you're a Christian by your fruit. Not by how much we know. Fruit, yeah, thank you. One thing that struck me that I've never really seen before is uh, there's a reference that produce um, followers, something out of stones. I tell you that all these stones God can raise up children. And for a, an ethnic Israelite, uh, the way people who weren't Israel were allowed to work while as stones. And I'm like, God actually did that. He raised the people out of nothing to worship him. Lead the coming wrath. Lead the coming, yeah. That's hard for me. That Through the coming wrath is hard for me because as I talk to people, my personal inclination is not to highlight the judgment of God because I think people feel it pretty hard. But you read the text and you can't get away from it. It's there. Ourselves to be Abraham. Ethnicity is not a salvation guarantee. Not many of us are Jews, but it's sometimes it's helpful to realize that we are not the center of God's cultural identity as people who follow Him. Yeah. I want the passage to speak directly to you um, more than just me talking to you. And I think. Uh, what we do when we come here to worship isn't just to hear about the word, we come here to do the word. And that's why I have a cow. That's why I have a cow on that thing here. Kind of a cute cow. But I'm going to ask you to sacrifice it this morning um, here in church. And obviously it's a paper cow because actual sacrifices aren't needed anymore. Um, but we're gonna, I'm going to invite you to write things on here and then we're going to sacrifice it in a minute. So Joel Franken has uh, a cool thing, and I wanted to show it to you this morning as sort of a way to bring this home in terms of an illustration. So, you know, this is something I always wanted, <laughs> a stoplight. I've never stolen one. I even really thought of stealing one, to be honest. One of the few things I probably have thought of taking. Um, but is it upside down? It is upside down. Right? That's how they go? Like this? Really? <laughs> That's, true. That's true. So these are great things. These are great things. They keep us from dying. They keep us from like hitting each other in an intersection. But how many of you all like really love stoplights when you're sitting at them? And this particular light is on, right? It's kind of irritating. And I've gone so far as to realize like when this thing lasts a minute. I don't get frustrated um, randomly, I get frustrated specifically at the city engineers that haven't adjusted the lights properly for my convenience, right? And uh, it's just really frustrating. So, uh, how many of us are happy when it uh, is green, right? That, that makes us happy when it's green for us. We don't really think about the other people you need to stop, like, yes, I hit the light, it's green. And if I drive a little bit faster, I'll hit the next one green, too. Um, so the meanings on these are pretty clear. Red means stop, green means go. And uh, so, so, what does yellow mean? Yeah, it's not thinking, right? Hit that gas. Like, my family doesn't always agree. Now, Anna's learning how to drive, so she's like, also knows the rules and pays attention. So, yellow means, or orange, it's actually orange, I guess, but it means go faster, right? Or not. Uh, it actually means slow down or proceed with caution. And I think the analogy is pretty direct towards God's spiritual guidance. Sometimes uh, when we're following Him, and this is probably the case in most of our lives when we're following Him, uh, we get the green light. Like, yeah, that's the good and appropriate thing to do if, if we're supposed to take our families and pay the bills and do good and right moral things. Uh, these aren't the things that cause us problems. But God's Spirit continually, the Spirit of the Covenant, um, continually gives us the green light on things. Sometimes, there we go. Sometimes we get a clear no, like, and you know, there's certain areas of life where we just know 
don't go there. Especially if we spend years fighting an addiction, we know pretty well that we're not going to go back there, otherwise we're going to do that again. Like me with smoking, I used to smoke, and if I went back there, um, that would be a bad thing, and I would be uh, buying Camels and a few other brands that I really like again. So, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So it's a clear, clear no. The problem is when this yellow light comes on, we just don't always know what to do, right? Do I slow down? Do I speed up? Like, what's the safest thing? I don't want to get branded. And I just honestly really want to go. But as we walk with God and the covenant, often we get a yellow light, and it's just a thing to say, pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention to this intersection. There's a decision to be made. You need to pay attention. And sometimes the Spirit wants to slow us down so we make a better decision. It's not a stop, but it's a better decision. He says, you're getting a little off here. Getting a little angry. Spending a little too much money. Eating a little too many dessert. Well, I shouldn't bring that up right now. Um, but there's something like, often it's like, just slow down. Like, get this a lot here and that says, pay attention. And sometimes I pay attention to the pay attention light. And sometimes I'm like, nope, I'm just going to keep going. But God invites us time and time again to pay attention, and ultimately sometimes, when we blow through it, and sometimes we ignore the red light too, and we think, I'm pretty sure it looks green, and just keep on going, then it's time to pay attention, and be honest with God, and be honest with ourselves, and be honest with the people we love, that we sin. And the way to get back into a relationship with God, and this is a powerful thing, I want to break his light, that's a powerful thing about the Bible, and about the God of the Covenant, Jesus doesn't come condemning everybody for everything they've ever done wrong. He comes inviting people back into relationship in a whole variety of ways. And as we lead into communion this morning, I want to invite you to take that little uh, cute cow outline and consider what God might want to convict you of, what God might want to have you offer, what God might want you to pray and to cry out to Him this morning. And for some of us, and I usually talk about this when I do communion, but I won't talk about it now. For some of us, it's like a little conviction thing, I need to do this, and that action is done. Some of us have this, what's called besetting sins, we just can't get rid of them, and we don't know what to do, and it sort of oppresses us. We really, 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 really don't want it in our lives. And it's appropriate to go to God time and time again and say, God, I don't want this. Please take it from me. Please take it from me. Please cure me. Please fix me. Please do something in my life. Give me a refiner's fire, even if it hurts. Purify me from all unrighteousness. I want to be made new. If there's something in your life that you don't want to be made new, I want to encourage you to pray to God. Say, God, at the very least, I want to want you. I want to be in a relationship with you. I don't want to go off this way, this way, this way, and get further and further. I mean, I want to get closer and closer to you. Whatever God is inviting you to deal with Him, I want to invite you to do so. So I'm going to invite uh, Annie to play just some reflective music. And while she does that, I'm going to take out my uh, lawnmower burn barrel. Uh, Potter's house is here Friday, and they asked to use the burn barrel. This one wheeled over quite nicely. And so I thought I'd use it this morning, too. And it's a representation that uh, Jesus comes to us. That's true. Jesus comes to us. He tabernacled with us, and He comes to each one of us. I know we come to church here. It's good to go to places where we can learn and fellowship. But in fact, Jesus came to each one of us. And so this morning, I'm going to invite you to tear that little cow out. It's supposed to be kind of noisy and messy because often tearing things out of the lake is. And right on there is some representation, or if you don't want to write, you want your neighbor to see it, that's fine too. Um, and then we'll pass it down to the middle, because we do this in community, even though we don't share it with everybody. We do this in community, and the people on the aisle, I just want to invite you to put us in here. Um, many of you know this, I would love to have fire in church, but it would make this place sink badly in some ways that would be. So I'll burn it afterwards, but as a representation. And um, I'll open in prayer, and they can pray, and then I'll live this up and down the aisle. So Father God, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you that you are the messenger of the covenant, that you long to be in relationship with us. And some of us this week have uh, done some things that are pretty far outside the covenant. And I pray that as we confess our sins, that you would be faithful and just, and you would hear our prayer, that you would heal us from all unrighteousness and bring us back into relationship with you. But some of us, as we make our offerings, realizing that we're being called to make a step of faith that's pretty big. And it might be with our lives, it might be with what you're calling us to do, and it involves risk, and involves uh, perhaps our family and people around us don't understand, and it involves social risk, it involves financial risk, it involves 
a major risk trusting on you, but yet you're calling us, Lord. And I pray that we'd step out in faith and do whatever you're calling us to do, and that you protect us and guide us and provide for us in the middle of that. Some of us are being invited um, to have a conversation with somebody that we've been avoiding for a good long time. And your spirit has been convicting. Your spirit has been saying there's an opportunity. And as we offer that to you, Lord, I pray that you would provide exactly the right situation for that conversation to happen, and that you would give life in the middle of that conversation. But some of us just need strength to do what we're called to do. And we come to you yet again saying, Father, we offer you our lives, and we ask that you give us strength for obedience, for perseverance, for courage, for fortitude, for faithfulness, for stewardship, for obedience to you, Lord. Whatever it might be, whether it's that or something else, Lord, I pray that you would move in our spirits and equip us to give our offering of repentance or obedience or prayer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to die and to live for us and to live in our hearts. And this morning as we enter a time of communion, I pray that you in fact will live within each one of us as we confess our sins. Lord, you said you are faithful and just and will forgive our sins and heal us from all unrighteousness. Lord, you said that you'd be a refiner's fire, that you would baptize us with the Spirit and with fire. And I pray this morning that you would do just that. That you would move in our lives to do what only you can do. That you would move in our lives that it would be impossible to bring freedom, to bring purification, to bring reconciliation, to bring renewal. But as we give our lives to you, we ask you that you once again would give your life to us and that you would live within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we do get to participate in communion this morning. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, was the Passover night, celebrating Passover with his disciples in the upper room in a place that was hidden. And most likely, um, at the beginning of, well not most likely, at the beginning of that supper, he took the bread and he broke it, which he normally would have done. But as he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And at the same time, he would have said, blessed are you, O Lord our God, who brings forth bread from the earth, uh, indicating his own coming forth from the earth. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, one of the four cups of the Passover, and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then in Corinthians, Paul says, whenever you do this, whenever you take the bread, whenever you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and his resurrection, and you proclaim to Jesus, the mediator and messenger of the covenant that you want him to live in you, and he does by his spirit. He lives in each one of us to purify us, to cleanse us, to equip us, to help us be who we're called to be in this world. Whenever you drink it, you proclaim the Lord's death and his resurrection until he comes again. So the bread which we break is our participation in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ.
millions upon millions throughout the ages in the past, present, Sunday, and heaven of taking Jesus Christ into ourselves. So take, eat, remember and believe that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. The cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is our participation in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus. 
believe for us and for our salvation. So take, drink, remember and believe that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete remission and forgiveness of all our sins. I just thank you this morning. We thank you for being the messenger of the covenant. We thank you for refining us with wonders of with fire for making us new. We thank you for confronting us and telling us directly what we need to do. And we ask that by the power of your spirit, you live in us anew to help us be the people that we are called to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's time for dessert. But before we do that, I want to say a couple of uh, really direct things. I think your son is here today, too. Um, so it's easy in a passage like this, in a sermon like this, service like this, if you're really struggling with something very real, to say, well, it was nice, but you don't know what I'm dealing with. And that's true, I don't. Um, but I do recognize that there's some really tough situations in each one of our lives. Uh, someone who's usually here is in jail this morning because she had a really, really, really bad uh, week and night. And life is hard, but we do this because of it. We do this because we want to remember and be filled again with God's Holy Spirit so we can deal with life on life's terms. If you need prayer, if you need to process anything, uh, Jim and Jane are here, and Pastor, I think someone will join them, or if you just need to use the altar and pray, I want to encourage you to take time to process whatever you need to process with God. So in Numbers, uh, there's this blessing that we say many weeks, and it's called uh, the Priest of Blessing, the Ironic Blessing from Aaron. And it's an affirmation again that in spite of everything that uh, screams at us differently, that God loves us, and He wants to bless us, and He wants us to have an amazing uh, life with Him and with the people around us. Let's stand as we hear God's blessing and go into the world. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine up on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Go in the power of the Spirit. Go in the knowledge of the Father who loves you. And go in the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.